Hi everyone, it's me, Krillius, Team Racing Productions MC and producer. And joining me today is author Bernita Haynes. How are you? I'm good. It's a fabulous day. It's beautiful outside here in Georgia. Oh, wow. Well, it is not that beautiful here. <laughs> but I hope for viewers watching this, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful day for them. I'm living for this wonderful, beautiful Georgia sunlight coming through the window. That is great to see. Um, Georgia has a special place in my heart. It's my second or third home away from home. So yeah, I, I really enjoy it there. And it's so great to have you here to you know talk about one your newest book and you know just a, a full catch-up into bernita haynes so what i actually want to begin with is you know giving our viewers a little bit of an introduction of yourself and you know what inspires your writing yeah so i'm bernita haynes uh i have been writing ever since i could pick up a pencil and put it to paper essentially uh, I realized early on that I was going to have to have a quote unquote real job. So I'm, I'm an attorney by trade, um, although I no longer practice. And in terms of what really inspires my writing, I feel like it's kind of like what inspires me to, um, you know, pursue the kinds of movies that I pursue, watch the movies I watch. I'm constantly looking for representation of folks like me, who look like me, who live like me, and so forth. So. And I mean, that is very powerful, really, really powerful. Um, and I really connect with that because that's something that inspires me as well, um, especially when it comes to representation in certain genres of writing, like sci-fi, fantasy, things like that. Because um, I don't know if this is your experience, but it certainly is mine. I grew up reading a lot of genre books like that um, and watching a lot of TV shows and movies like that. And so I, that's always encapsulated my mind and that's how I've always kind of written but um you know many of them really had you know white male characters or even if they were female characters it was white female characters and it's you know you kind of know what the protagonist you are getting is going to be giving in, mm -hmm. in these things most of all uh talk to me about how you wanted to really bring that representation forward in your writing yeah, I definitely started out reading a lot of genre type books when I was younger, whether it was Goosebumps, uh, C.S. Lewis. Yes. But I got really, my favorite book, my favorite chapter book when I was a kid was Matilda. Ah, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm obsessed with telekinesis because of Matilda, by the way. I am. <laughs> I am. Look, I was so into Matilda. And I actually think it's one of the better books that got adapted to film, to movie. But one of the things that always felt missing when I was reading it um, was, you know, like where, surely there are little black kids that could be, you know, witches. In the classroom, right? <laughs> right, and even later on, once Harry Potter arrived on the scene, mm -hmm. it's still, it's just, you know, the black characters are kind of like in the background. Yeah, Dean Thomas was all the way over there. He got a little dating storyline and that was it. <laughs> That's it. That's it. They had, um, what was it, um, Angelina with the braids and so on. Yes, uh-huh. And she really didn't get much development Not at all. all. Not at all. And no and no real discussion of the microaggressions that, was, that were coming at her from other yes, kids. Yes, um, yes, yes. But yeah, so I really wanted to... I wanted to make sure that I could write the kind of stories that would satisfy those kinds of, those kids like me, yeah, um, yeah. who were yearning to see themselves represented, who didn't want to necessarily watch a, or read or watch a struggle movie or read a struggle mm -hmm. book. They just wanted to be magical. Yes, um, yeah. They wanted to be super powered mm -hmm. um, and for it to be normal and not to be like this huge thing that, you know, so I, re I, I started out, my first book um, was more of a paranormal. It was more in that kind of genre, that kind of space, where you're not necessarily sure what is happening and whether there is magical stuff afoot. Um, this second book, um, even The Faders, I dove right into all the magic, all the sci-fi, all the super-powered aspects. And a lot of that is due to my co-writer as well, my partner, my life partner, um, who is heavy into sci-fi and comic books. And we kind of like gel together an idea for a story. 
And it centers on um, a queer woman of color, a queer black woman who's also polyamorous. Oh. Um, right? Yeah. I said, let me just throw the whole kitchen sink in there. <laughs> yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah, and it also, and not only that, um, you know, the other thing that I always thought wasn't really represented was from a class standpoint, where are the kids who come from a little bit of a, you know, poor background, but let's not make their story a struggle story. You know, yeah. let's get their yes. story. They're poor, but they find out they're in this sort of magical realm, the magical world that they didn't even know existed, opens their eyes to things they couldn't have possibly imagined. Oh, um, so Eve comes from that kind of working class background, but she's one of the more powerful people in the world and doesn't really realize it. Wonderful. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what the process was like uh, writing this latest book. Oh, and give us the tights and everything too. Give us the tights and everything too. And give me the process because I know this was, you know, done during the pandemic, quite a bit of it. And so I'm sure that must have uh, colored or affected your your perception or, or whatever you were writing in that way, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, the process is, it's always so funny to talk about the process because I'm one of those people who just edits, 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 edits before I ever give it to my editor. Yeah. Um, so technically, um, this book, since it was co-written, um, it's part of a two-part series. Eve and the Faders is the name of the first book. It's part of the Faders and Alphas series. Um, I actually wrote the draft of it back in 2015 um, when I was still in Chicago. Ah. I published my first book, which is called Landry and Morrison. And I tabled it. I'm really a huge fan of tabling, getting a draft done quick, and then just tabling it for like a year, solid. I really think it's so important to be able to step away from your writing. Um, and so once I actually stepped back um, to this book and actually started like revising it, um, the process is actually pretty straightforward at that point. I just went into it, started revising, and I read it to make sure that the, the characters felt real. Yeah. The made sense. Are the character motivations, like, are they right? So, so fun. sometimes, because sometimes when you do step away from your writing and then you look back, there's more things that come to you that you never saw before. And some things you're like, mm, I'm not sure that really works yeah. anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's literally a key part of editing your own work is being able to put it aside for extended periods of time. Yes, yes. Um, and it's hard to do that because you can get really excited in the process and you're just kind of like really trying to get it done. But the more you can just force yourself to slow down, the better your writing, I think, ends up being. But it was so funny when I came back um, because I revised it and I was like, okay, this is feeling good. The character's motivations feel a little bit more, you know, makes a little bit more sense. And then I gave it to my partner to read. Because the way that we co-wrote is, I wrote the draft of this book, mm -hmm. he wrote the draft of the second book. And then ah. we edited each other's writing. So that's how we, and we put our each other's ideas into uh, the revisions. So I gave it to him and he was like, I think Eve, Eve doesn't have, does she have a love life? And I was like, wow, Eve doesn't have a love life at all. And um, she's just kind of like really ultra invested in people that she doesn't know very well. And that's fine, but I think you have to really ground the character's motivations and them doing things for people that they know and love. Yeah. Even if it tags on helping people that they don't know, that's just reality, mm -hmm. even in fiction, um, even in fantasy. And so I did a huge overhaul rewrite um, of Eve's core uh, relationships in the book. And that's where we ended up with um, Eve being in a polyamorous relationship where she's mostly um, attached to the, to the woman in this relationship. But they're all kind of, they're so non-dramatic. One of the things yeah. that all the readers have told me um, who have reached out to me is that you really figured out how to do a polyamorous relationship with none of the drama. I was without like, the drama, honey, without the drama, mama. <laughs> I was like, look, the drama is in this new job she snatches up yes. and all the that comes from that. Um, so once I like sort of added that layer and my, my partner was really caught off guard. He was like, oh, that's the relationship you decided to add. I just said, bring some romance in. And um, I was like, look, I'm just going all out. We had watched since we had recently watched Sense Eight. Okay. Multiple oh times. my God! Listen, you are a woman after my own heart because 
Big Sensei fan right here. I've rewatched it so many times. It's still a tragedy that it never got the ending that it deserved. It, a tragedy, a tragedy. And canceling it during Pride Month. That's like the uh, next During thing. Pride Month, the homophobia. <laughs> I almost canceled my subscription. I was like, this is outrageous. Yeah. But it's basically, since eight is like my partner and I, it's basically our favorite show. Mm -hmm. And like we've rewatched it over and over and over again. And I had just went through, I think, a second rewatch of it as I was um, doing the revision. And I was like, okay. And I was talking to one of my friends who's in a polyamorous relationship. And I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and it just, it worked out. And so the process after that was really just sort of putting it through revision after revision to make sure that even with this new sort of added layer that all the motivations make sense, the plot makes sense. So, I mean, we went through, what, at least six revisions before I sent it to an editor wow. um, who gave me an overarching kind of like summary of what she thought it, it needed. And then after I did that next big revision, I gave it to a beta reader or two beta readers. Ah. Um, and they gave me feedback that I input before I finally reached back out to my editor for a final copy edit. Um, so it was, when I tell you it was so many edits, um, I cannot exaggerate. And I really just kind of took my time with it. Yeah. I didn't push it. I was like, I don't have a timeline for myself really. Yeah. If I was, um, you know, represented by, you know, some agency or whatnot mm -hmm. and was trying to go the traditional route, I would have been, I would have more of a timeline. But one of the reasons I don't, I haven't pursued that route yet is because I, I really don't want to make my writing feel like a job. So, yeah. I get that, I get that, I get that so much. Uh, and you know, since we've touched upon, you know, queer relationships, polyamory and everything, you know, we're just stepping out of Pride Month. Uh, tell me what Pride means to you and Pride Month in general, especially considering, I guess, last year's pride was you know unprecedented and you know this year's pride is also quite unprecedented it's the first one we've had since a pandemic so talk to me a little bit about that i would say the last three have been last three or four have been crazy because remember um when um the same-sex marriage decision came down it came oh down. yes uh -huh. 2015. Mm -hmm. yeah so I, yeah it's been a, a few months a few years of like really interesting pride months but for me, it's always, it's, I feel like it's a bigger deal for me in some ways than it is for some of my friends who are, who are very sort of like active and whatnot in the queer communities and the cities that they live in. Because I always feel a little bit isolated from the community for a couple of reasons. I'm overly introverted, although I'm married to a very extroverted individual. Um, but I'm overly introverted. And on top of it, I'm bisexual and I'm married to a man. Yeah. And so it's, that always creates this sort of weird space mm -hmm. um, in the queer community. Like yeah, you never yeah. really feel like you're fully in it, but you never really feel like you're out of it either because yeah, as soon yeah. as you hang around too many straight people, you realize, yeah, they don't know. This is, you're like, oh, mm. They this don't is. know. <laughs> I'll never forget when I went to karaoke with my, with my partner and all his improv friends and I didn't realize just how straight they all were until I decided to pull up the Scissor Sisters song. <laughs> And you're like, oh my God, I've never heard of this. I like this. And you're like, wow, it's really a different, uh, yeah. it really, it shows just how different, you know, we are experiencing life. How yeah. Different. I was like, y'all really are in a whole different vibe. I see. Um, and so queer, so Pride Month always means a lot to me for that reason, because I like to reaffirm for myself you know, what it means to me to be part of these two communities, but also to be kind of like outside of them. I also am very, very um, invested in kind of reaffirming to other young bisexual folks that it's okay to feel like you don't really ever belong in one space or the other. Um, just know that there is that, there is that weird middle space that you do belong to. It's just that we don't hang out together very much. <laughs> uh, mainly because we never know who we are for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Really aware sometimes when people are in opposite sex relationships that one partner is bisexual. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's always interesting when I'm um, around a couple and I find out sometime down the line that one partner is, is is queer, is bisexual, and there's always this question of you know if one partner in the relationship is um, you know queer, bisexual, pansexual, does that make the relationship queer? My answer is always yes because you're in a relationship with a queer person. Um, 
And it's so funny. I don't think, I don't, I'm pretty sure my partner did not realize he was in a queer relationship until we had that conversation. Cause I was always out, um, always, um, ever since I was 21, I was always out. And so I never disguise or hide that. And, uh, but I don't think it registered for him like, oh, that means I'm in a queer relationship. And then, you know, once we had that conversation, he's like, okay, all right, yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I wonderful, mean, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. that, I love that. Um, so the book is out now. What's the feedback been like? Um, have you been enjoying the ride that your work is finally out and people can consume and enjoy and really, you know, ride this adventure that you've been on for a while? Putting a book out there is like literally releasing a baby into the mm -hmm. world. It's so, you have really nurtured it by the time you send it out there. Um, and if you're perfectionistic like me, you've made, you've tried to make sure every T is crossed, every I is dotted, the cover has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, people have been giving us such amazing feedback. Um, I think right now we have like a full five stars on Amazon with like 10 ratings um, or something like that. Um, I've heard people refer to it as intersectional, which I'm happy to hear. Yes. Um, one person said better than TV. Um, <laughs> yeah. And what we got so much positive feedback on was the cover. Uh, um, and I was actually, we were going to hire a cover designer, mm -hmm. but my partner has a lot of visual arts skills. Um, and I'm very snazzy in terms of graphic design. Ah. It's like, let's take a stab at it and see. And um, so many people reached out to us and it's just like, oh my God, the cover art, like who did it? And I was like, well, turn to the back of your book because it will say cover design by us. Well, you know, I, I just might be looking for a cover artist soon. Yeah. And I'm just saying, I'm glad I just heard this because I just might be reaching out. <laughs> Look, I will put it, I will put it on his radar because literally I didn't even, I, you know, when we sat down to do the cover, we were just kind of playing around and I was like, let's just see what sticks. And then what stuck was like, it just really worked. Um, so yeah, if you do need some cover art help, um, certainly, certainly. Let us know. but, but yeah, it's been, we've been getting great feedback. Um, one of, a couple of friends of ours are using it for their, they're recommending it for their book club. I'm definitely trying to get people who are interested in sci-fi and who want to see more marginalized characters um, to, you know, recommend it to their book clubs and so forth. I tried to make it simple by creating some book club questions um, that are on the site, on my website. But yeah, we've been getting lots of good feedback. I'm excited. Amazing, amazing. I love it. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just so glad to see, you know, other, you know, queer black writers putting these stories out. I really wish I had them when I was younger. And I'm so glad, you know, that so many now are coming out that we, we really like this is happening. And um, I'm really, really, really excited about that. So for viewers, could you let them know where they can pick up a copy of the book? Yes, you can find a copy of Even the Faders on all major online retailers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can also visit my website at BernitaHaines.com or hunt for me on, on Twitter as well. Awesome, 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 beautiful. Bernita, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been such, such a pleasure. And I already know what's going to be my new summer read, Eve and the Fader. I really appreciate you having me. Love certainly, it. Certainly, <laughs> certainly. I'm so excited to read it. And to our viewers, make sure you pick up a copy and you can follow Team Racine on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Team Racine. And Thank you for watching. Bye, everyone. <laughs> we thank our production sponsor, Whitman Walker Health, for continuously supporting Team Racine Productions. Thank you.